work done by US firm research affiliates expects economic growth in the US to be just one third of the 3.3% it has averaged since 1950. Some of the factors contributing to this lower forecast are a slower population growth, a declining labor absorption rate, and more muted productivity gains. So what effect will this have on the world economy and South Africa in particular? Andrew Newell from Canon Asset Managers joins us to answer these questions. It's a big order in terms of getting to all those questions. <laughs> but let's start with an, an overriding theme on the economics front from Canon Asset Managers. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's with the influence that the global environment, the developed world, is going to have on the emerging market story. Um, Warren, there's, well, there's two parts. So the, the world average uh, will be robust, it will continue growing, but to come back to the advanced or developed world that you refer to, uh, the research affiliates research is, is quite sound and in the order of 1% growth for the US is certainly not what we've become used to. That theme permeates through to Europe, the UK, Japan, uh, the whole developed world really. And taking that in conjunction with a developing or a dynamic world where demand and growth, we think, will remain intact, you get uh, an aggregate figure which is satisfactory. So we're not heading for doom and gloom across the world, but it is made up of two baskets, a very sluggish developed world and a dynamic set of countries which actually looks pretty decent. Well, the fact that it's not doom and gloom is <laughs> a good place to start, I think, Warren? Yes, uh, Andrew, I mean, uh, our economy has been aligned with, with the UK and the US. You know, it, it's much mm. broadly aligned with those than, than some of the emerging economies, although that's changing quite rapidly. Uh, you know, what does it mean for us? Does it mean that we almost have to orient our businesses more towards uh, developing economies? And f for that, we need a government that goes out inside and trade agreements with the likes of Brazil and India mm. and China and Indonesia and those places. Mm. Or, you know, what do we take from this? Do we just expect lower economic growth globally now for, for a number of years. Yeah, there are two parts to your, your question, so I'll give you two parts to my answer. We do remain closely tied to the, the advanced world, and that's not something that will change tomorrow, unfortunately. So as much as they face these headwinds and these obstacles which they need to try and overcome, and we don't see them doing that soon, that is going to hamper our economic advancement. The second part to your question is we are increasingly linked to the emerging world, which is good because, as I've already suggested, we think that their growth will remain intact. And if we are exporting and trading with them more and more, that in turn will impact our economy positively. So by way of example, it's not just China, Brazil, uh, India, they are very important, but our own sub-Saharan Africa, uh, some of them are very close to us, our immediate neighbors, but a little bit further north as well, there our exports have increased 20% over the last year. Now, that's positive. Is it enough? No. Is it a step in the right direction and as a trend, Absolutely, it's great. And I know Adrian Seville, your CIO, has been following the African story very closely yeah. of late and, and looking at the growth numbers coming yeah. out of the continent. The, the stat that I put to President Zuma recently in Davos was that we, we're sitting at a 5.3% projected growth rate for the African continent as per the African Development Bank's projections. If you strip South Africa out of that equation, you're actually looking at a 6% growth rate. Mm. So South Africa being the drag right now, is that yeah. going to be the story going forward? The, are we going to be negative and pull the, the 6 down to 5.3? Uh, I want to say no, um, but those are the numbers they've put forward, then so be it. The, the fact remains that will we get to 5.3 as a continental average, highly unlikely. We, we throw around numbers of five and six that we need, absolutely, that is what we need, but we don't think we'll get there uh, in the near future. Two, two and a half uh, is, is probably a more realistic Continental outcome. Continental growth at two and a half. Uh, no, no, sorry, South Africa. South Africa. Africa yeah. In other words, our contribution to the continental 5.3 is less than average, and so by inference, it will be It will we actually will pull it down, so if you took it out because of its uh, quantum, the 5.3 should lift should margin. lift to, to yeah. 6%, which is yeah. the equation. Andrew, I just wanted to ask, I mean, do you think we're doing uh, well enough uh, positioning South Africa as the gateway to Africa because it seems from our discussions when, with portfolio managers on the show mm. and, and decision makers is that uh, many investors kind of see Africa now as a, a three hub continent where you've got the West Africa, East Africa and mm. Kenya and then South Africa serving this sort of static area. You know, is there anything we can do to sort of 
enhance South Africa's profile mm -hmm. better or create a, a better environment from which businesses can launch onto the continent? Yeah, so you started your question by saying, are we doing enough? My short answer, no, um, we're not. The, the sort of general mindset has for a long time been that South Africa is the gateway into Africa, and I think that's becoming less and less relevant. And you can look at this in different ways. Uh, Nigeria as the hub the of the West. 170 million great. consumer story. <laughs> Surely Absolutely. has got to take over as the gateway. Boy, you need, a, you need to work hard to, to overcome that uh, as a 50 million economy. So we're a third of the size population-wise. Um, East Africa, a wonderful growth story. Huge infrastructure investment spending going on. Kenya building what they call Silicon Savannah. So our answer to, uh, to California. Those are the types of things we need to be doing. And you know, recent news that our conversion um, in terms of internet and broadband, uh, that, doesn't, you know, that doesn't fill me with uh, glee. Those are the types of things we need to get right. Uh, and, we, and our labor competitiveness. Uh, and our labor competitive must increase as well. Uh, you know, all of these things can be debated at great length. We obviously don't have the luxury of that tonight, but uh, these things need to be addressed in a far more efficient way. Uh, today, for instance, we hear that uh, education is now called an essential part of our policy. That's great, and I think that's a wonderful step in the right direction. But it's been a long time coming. It, it has have been, been a long come, part of time our coming. Policy we, a long time ago. You know, as South Africans, we have habits of wonderful plans and strategies. This needs to be implemented. We need some execution of this good idea. So let's take that macro environment and drill down now into mm. an investment play for 2013. Obviously, right. January is behind us. Where do you see the most value as a house right now? Uh, at the asset class level, we favor equities. Uh, drilling down into our equity markets, we see two distinct pockets of attraction and one area where we are quite cautious. The area that we are cautious is generally large industrial companies, industrial oriented, uh, so not just factories and warehouses, but I'm speaking specifically about cash retailers and globally exposed firms, uh, Richemont, British American Tobacco, SAB Miller and the like. The places we find good value is in the more domestically oriented industrials. Generally, they are in the mid and small cap part of our market. So, um, engineer but, but let's be honest, Andrew, yes. you guys love small and mid caps, don't you? It's it's one of your like yes, it's, tail it. <laughs> it's one of those areas that you go looking for bargains. Uh, that is true, but uh, I would I would put a sort of a caveat to that. It's not that we like mid and small caps. We like them now because that's where the value almost exclusively resides. And so, if you look at a Canon portfolio, you will see an overwhelming number of mid and small caps. So your comment is true, but for a different reason, if if that's fair to say. Uh, so those stocks we find great value and we've seen some nice um, sort of runs over the last couple of months. F believe it or not, uh, some of the construction stocks have set up. Uh, we've waited some time for that. We've discussed those companies before. Um, but not just construction, related firms like ELB Bateman, uh, Hudeco, which supplies into the construction and the mining industry as well. And then the resources sector quite broadly is undervalued, which is not surprising given the stresses that the sector has faced, both from concerns about global growth, and we've addressed that to some point now, but also some of the labor unrest, political uncertainty. So, and so, so what on. will be the value or the, the value unlock here for the resources? You've mentioned labor, mm. you've mentioned the global uh, economic picture. Are those the two factors that need to turn around aggressively for us to see some momentum in these resource stocks? Yeah, I think those are the two key ones. So in terms of uh, labor disruptions and social tensions or stresses, we need policy clarity. Whatever form that might take, it might be to say that uh, the platinum companies go ahead with retrenchments or they don't, but just make a decision on which one it is. From a global growth perspective, more visibility in demand and what they want. Now, for instance, over the last couple of weeks, iron ore prices, as you know, have hit all-time highs. That's a nice barometer. Perhaps that's a first step in understanding where global growth might be headed. Uh, it looks robust. That's obviously one component, um, but it is certainly an early indication. 
just bringing that back to the resources, you mentioned obviously improved commodity prices help every uh, resource company. But with regards to the costs, mm. uh, we've got Eskom that are pitching for 16% year-on-year increases out to uh, 2018. We've got uh, labor unions, which we're unsure of what sort of wage settlements you, we can expect going forward as an investor. Yeah. So when you say that they are cheap, uh, you know, you've got to be fairly sure that there's some containment in costs. Mm. Is there any distinction between any any of the resource companies in terms of their cost base that you can make as, a, as an investor and say, these guys will operate more cheaper than, than others? Or is it pretty much across the board? It, uh, I think across the board resources are attractive. The yeah. I suppose the starting point is a lot of these cost inputs are priced in, and we think excessively so. So it's not necessarily about saying uh, ESCOM's increase of 16% will be 16 or they will be 12 or uh, they might be 20 something. It's I think all resource companies have had these factored into their earnings and some have just been really hard hit. So they're all attractive. I think what you want to do is find those companies that have been harder hit and you know, this might become subjective but which ones unfairly so. Um, and there are different ways you can look at it. Uh, what is their own long-term average price multiple? How they're done relative to peers? Um, now, you, you're talking about <laughs> the resource block. You know yes. I'm going to push you further. I want specific uh, stocks here. That's fine. Let, let's chat about Anglo-American. I know it's mm. been a play of Canon Asset Managers for, for some time. The, the recent news flow, Mark Kutifani taking over as the, the CEO from mm. Cynthia Carroll. Are you looking for value unlock? Have you changed your position in Anglo Gold, uh, not Anglo Gold, Anglo American? <laughs> uh, no, we haven't. And yes, we are looking for value unlock. I think Anglo's is quite a good example of a company that has been oversold. It doesn't change the fact that they have uh, disappointed shareholders by the ongoing delays in Minas Rio specifically and the budget being nudged higher and higher and higher. We are told... So shareholders are at the end of their tether on this one? I think so, and I think the price has been pushed down appropriately. So where, where to from here? That's probably the more important question. And I think we, in Mark Kutufani, you've got a, a good operational guy in Anglo-American. And you know, can he suddenly turn it around tomorrow? No, I don't think anyone can suddenly turn around a business like that. But what we are getting is better visibility in terms of they are more and more confident that the project will come on stream. The budget, the, the over budget has been priced in. So that's in the numbers. And assuming that they are now able to commit or, or adhere to the time frame of getting the production on stream, I think we'll get better sense of how much volume is actually coming out. Now the numbers are very attractive. Take them with a pinch of salt given that <laughs> many investors are so once bitten twice shy. We're out of time. Final, final 10 second yes. statement on Anglo-American and we leave it there. Uh, excellent quality, diversified portfolio and value will be unlocked.